Yeah, my name is Bruce Bent. I'm a docent here at the museum. I'm here basically uh, at least every Sunday afternoon. Sometimes my wife accuses me of having to have a bed moved in here because I spend so much time here. But it's really a labor of love, and it's just a fun place to come to. There isn't a Sunday that goes by that I don't learn something that I didn't know before. You should all take a chance and come down here and get really surprised. It's what, what, a project that Dave mentioned that we're on restoration with. That's a Norwegian sailing pram is what it is. Why don't you take us over there? Let's check it out. You're more than happy to do that. Oh, I love this. I love the walking. Hey! <laughs> now she's... Are we on her? We're on. Okay. She's a 16-foot pram, and they're still used today in Norway. This one, however, is almost 120 years old. And when we got her, she had been sitting in a lady's at, uh, attic of her barn for probably 40 years. So she was in really tough shape. The planks had all split on her, and we had to completely strip her down to bare wood. And there's pictures of that being done in the, in the book right Great. there. But we replaced one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight planks on her, right from scratch, and we had to put a bunch of new ribs in her as well. But she's pretty well finished now. We have to put one more coat of the, the green paint, which goes with our other name, the Irish Mossing Museum. Uh, the Maritime is right here, <laughs> as well as upstairs. So, so, so this is actually a mossing boat? Not a mossing boat. Okay, what kind? This one came from Norway. Okay. It was used as a lighter. When the large sail ships came into the Norwegian harbors, uh -huh. they couldn't get close enough to the wharves to unload them. So they would send these boats out to act as lighters that took the goods off of the big boats, put them on these, and they brought them into the shore. So that gives you an idea of how old she is. She's a big boat. You know, she's only uh, 16 feet long. But if you look at the width, you can see how massive she really is and how much she probably really weighs. They're still using them today in Norway in certain ports. It's just the most practical boat they can get. Now the original ones, including this one, had a mast piece in the center so they could use it as a, as a sailor as well. Right. And they would sail out to the ships coming in, drop the sail, tie it off, and then offload the goods onto there. Great. And one of the fun things that we've had with this is having to build a lot of our own tools, such as these rather interesting looking vices, and they work beautifully too. They're uh, made of oak, and you just jam them in between the pieces and you can pull the planks right in tight. So they work beautifully. We have a whole set of them that we've used. This boat is a mossing boat. This is a mossing dory that was right. used by Tucker, one of the local people who's uh, also rows it almost professionally. And he's rowed it in a great number of the uh, Canadian Gloucester races, the hand races up there, and he's won every time. Now Tucker has also entered this into the same, the same festival that we're entering next week with the other boat, the one you just saw. Uh, also notice first, hand-powered boat. Now we're hoping to beat him this coming year, so we'll find out what happens. The, uh, this little boat, it's hung, up, hung from the ceiling. It was built by Scott again. He actually used it as a mossing boat. As small as it is, he did very well with it. It's all hand built. And he built quite a number of them. Dave Ball, our president, had one as a kid. So it gives you an idea. This is one other type of mossing boat. And this boat, this is a Delano skiff. And the Delano skiff was very, very popular around the turn of the century and up into the 20s and 30s. She's a pretty, pretty boat. So she, this particular one is close to 100 years old now. And as you can see, the restoration on this has been beautiful, beautifully done, too. She's not a monster. She's a pleasure boat. And she's a fascinating little craft. So we keep her in here with the good guys. And they were ready to get it ready for shipping. They would throw the dried moss in here. And this would turn and crank this wheel and macerate all the moss up in almost a powder form. And then they would bag it so they could ship it anywhere in the world. What we have Walk here down. is a uh, parts of a shipwreck from the Forest Queen. There's a display inside. Okay. This is called concretion. Yeah. From the, and um, what we do is we have an interactive display where we let the people break up the concretion, see what they can find. 
And this is a ship that went down in 1853 off of Peggotty Beach, had uh, 12 to 13 Irish immigrants were on it. And it had sailed from New York and gone around the Cape. It went to China, picked up a load of stuff, went to San Francisco and uh, London and picked up a lot of wares. They did a lot of trading. And then it came in to off the coast here. They thought they were in Boston Harbor, hmm. but the light they weren't. And they uh, they bottomed out off of Peggotty Beach. There. And they had the first shipments of Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, 12 tons of silver, uh, kachil bugs, which were they ground up from China to make a, a dye, a purple dye, and uh, graphite. And they had a bunch of Stuff. One of the last vessels before they did what were the real fast ones? The real fast ships. The clipper ships. Clipper ships. This is a. This is one of the last ones that was sailing and doing um, training overseas before the clipper ships came in. So this was a, a, a three-masted bark, and uh, she had quite a bit of stuff on her. She was salvaged in the 1854, but they couldn't take everything. And, and that's what the shipwreck looks like, what you see right there. It's all concretion because the uh, everything's decayed, the iron, the wood, wood's almost all gone. And um, and the animals, they, they, they eat everything up and over the years their secretions form this concretion. I, I, I mean, if you just said to somebody, it's like, what did you do? I heard you guys like out on Saturday. It's Will like, hold it up again? we found a shipwreck yeah. pieces yeah. and we actually found something from the ship. <laughs> That's a hundred and fifty years old. We were diving on it two days ago. That's crazy. That's like really actually happening. We probably how many dives a year do you think, Tommy? We do on on the Forest Queen. Does not weather and the visibility? It yeah. does it anyhow. Yeah. Oh, at least. Oh, at least it does yeah. between us. Yeah. So, are you how how do, is this like a generally visited site? Like lots of people go there? Well, not really. People can. Dive, but they wouldn't know what they're looking at them. If you look at that underwater, you wouldn't know it was a shipwreck. Right. And uh, we're not stopping people from diving. I mean, yet. I think that must be true with lots of things in the ocean. Like, you know what you're I mean? Right. That there's like, well, you we, don't really know what you're looking at. We have this wreck as registered with the state. The oh, Mass okay, there you go. That's what I was, okay. The so. Taurus Queen is, uh, is registered with the Massachusetts Ooh. Department of Underwater Archaeology. And we have a permit to uh, take pieces that are off of it and bring them up and reduce them to education. And uh, so that's what that's what we do, Tom and Deb and I. And uh, the, the, our display, the main display, is is inside the building in here. And it's uh, you'll see it. it's called uh, Situate Treasure Ship because you'll it's you'll see it. All right, this is what we refer to as the captain's salon. Okay. And remember, they would be on sea voyages for as much as three and four years, nonstop at times. So they didn't get home too often. When they did get home, they wanted their room set up the way they had it, and that's it. But one of the things that we have that really kind of neat is an example of why sailors don't have a woman in every port. One of the things that they did constantly is buy things for their family and for their home, including the secretary, which was owned by a Captain Ichabod Cook. It's a local family, lives here in Situate. And he was killed in 1852 on board his ship with four of his, five of his cousins, I'm sorry, first cousins were on board as his crew. No one ever found a trace of them. They don't know what happened to them. But one of the things that was found afterwards by his wife was this octant in this book on navigation, which is 1851 edition. <clears throat> and she taught herself, very, very smart lady, how to use an octant and navigate. And she got so good at it that they began using her as the instructor, the teacher, for the young men who wanted to get their captain's papers. And she supported her remaining five children doing that.
these two rocking chairs. Now, we know that this little rocker was owned by a 13-year-old girl who died of smallpox. And when she died of smallpox, she was buried just at the little cemetery down the street here by the medical building. Not in the cemetery. She was buried just outside the cemetery because they were afraid that people who died from communicable diseases, the germs would crawl up and infect the people who were visiting their relatives who were in the museum. These toys down on the floor right here were her toys that she had played with, and they came back from the Orient, by, were brought back by her father. Um, so it, it's a pretty fascinating area. The little bisque doll in the corner, the little rocking chair, the cradle, the little table with the tea set on it. Most of the things that we have were donated by the families of the people. We don't buy anything, we just don't have the money for it. Um, for Captain Ezra Vinyl, a lot of things in situ at Norwell are named Vinyl This and Vinyl That. That's his original portrait, and we had that restored the year we opened the museum. And it cost us quite a bit of money, but it was well worth it, because nobody knew who he was until we had that done. Now, one of the other things we have is we have a tea set, and they're unusual by today's standards because the saucer has a very deep set on the saucer, and there's no handle on the teacups. Now, the reason for that was these people had a terrible fear burning their mouths with something that was hot. So what they did was they would get it poured into the teacup very gingerly and go pour it right into the saucer, blow it and cool it, and then they could pour it back into the cup or just drink it from the saucer. My grandfather drank his coffee from the saucer till the day he died, and I never knew why until I came here. <laughs> now if you want a verification of that, you read Mark Twain. Mark Twain ref references it in almost every one of his small stories on the Mississippi. The goods were poured, dipped, blown, and drunk. <laughs> and again, I mentioned that the captains or the seamen always brought things home for their wives. This is a black enameled gold inlay sewing kit. And it is literally gold inlay. You can feel the inlays when you rub your hands on it. That's a nice piece, but inside are what I think are the real treasures. These are all handmade elfin ivory sewing pieces and accoutrements. This is a lady's skirt vice. I don't know if you can get a real picture. Yeah, I'll get it close. And what they, what they did with these, and I'll pass it to you, it's easier. Okay. They would bunch their dresses in their skirts and use these as pieces yeah. so their skirts didn't fly up when they got in and out of carriages because they were all very, very shy, you know. This little cabinet, this is a sewing cabinet, this came back from the Far East as well. Now in this, there is a lady's little writing desk so she can write to her friends. Very, very neat. We have her pounce bottle in her inkwell. We close that and the second drawer is for nothing more than paper storage. So she would always have paper on hand. The third drawer is my favorite drawer. This is a sock drawer. Now remember, they would be away three or four years at a time. They'd wear through a lot of socks. Socks weren't cheap. They didn't throw them away like we do today. They'd rum, bumble, bundle them up and put them in the bottom of their sea bag, bring the sea bag home and go, darn those, honey, I'll bet you she said darn something. It wasn't the socks. <laughs> now one other thing before I let you go. If you turn around behind you and you see the little cabinet, on the mantle work piece right there, down to the end of the right. Yep. There you go, you're almost there. That was made by a gentleman named William Stoddard, who was a fisherman out at sea. And he made the piece out of driftwood that he picked up while fishing. The whole thing was made with nothing more than a pen knife and a piece of broken glass. It's an absolutely amazing piece. If you look at it, all the drawers are dovetailed, all fitted, matched. No glue is used in it. Somebody did put a nail on this one at one point because the dovetail broke off. But, but look at the inlays and everything else, but nothing more than a pen knife and a piece of broken glass. Wow. It's a spectacular piece. His name was William Stoddard, and the piece was made in 1844. 
and we've never had to do a thing to it. This painting on the, over the center of the mantelpiece is of Situate Harbor, the entrance to Situate Harbor, <laughs> as it appeared in roughly 1860. And it's one a of the, little different. <laughs> one of the things you'll notice is the cap on the lighthouse is missing. And you heard part of the story about that downstairs. The reason that it's missing is people were mistaking Situate Harbor light for Boston light coming back from England or Europe or the East, and they were running aground in Situate. Now, the people in Situate didn't mind them running aground. That was a nice source of income. <laughs> but <laughs> the federal but. government got a little upset about it. But one of the other, this whole, this picture tells the whole story into itself. Yeah, maybe, Katie, you can move back uh, a little. Or, or maybe, yeah. Just, just. You can go any way you want. Yeah, this, there you go. This also shows one of the very first representations of someone drying sea moss. Oh. That's what she's doing right there. 18, just around 1800. I don't remember the exact date, to be honest yeah. with you. But the other thing that's neat about this is if you look up on the top of First Cliff where all the big houses are today, there's a tent. That tent was pitched by the Wampanoag Indians who came here every year from mm -hmm. Taunton in the summer and caught codfish to use for their winter food. <coughs> we have a listing of the 1,027 ships oh. that we can verify were built here on the North River. It goes Whoa. first on this floor and also on that wall. There are, one, as I said, 1,027 ships. Some of the most famous ships in the world that people don't even realize were built here were uh, the Essex, the whale ship that was ran by the whale in the, in the Pacific, and now the big movie is out. Uh, she was built here. The Beaver, the Boston Tea Party ship, was built here. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the Columbia, which was the first ship to circumnavigate the globe under the United States flag, was also built here, who the Columbia River is named after. So, so at the listing, they have the name. We have the name, the tonnage, which gives a rough idea of her size, the year she was built, and then the yard that she was built in. And the names are just incredible. You could spend your lifetime looking up these ships. Now we're going into my year. Right. One of the things I love is this map that's on the wall. Now this is a map that's on the wall. It's not on paper, which is glued on the wall. He did it with pen and ink up on the wall. And it represents the North River in 1870. So that was before the outlet that you see to the ocean and the North River existed. Right. And I think you saw a part of that downstairs. But it also identifies the location of every one of the shipyards that oh. constructed those ships. And it goes all the way up into what today is Pembroke, up to the Indian Head River and the Indian Head Dam. So it's quite a collection of ships. And when I say ships, I'll give you an example. The H under Hanover shows the Fox Hill Yard, which is up in what you think was a very small part of the river. The ship that's in that case is a model I built for the museum that was built in the Fox Hill Shipyard. She was originally started as a merchant ship, but it was at the height of the whaling season. So they converted her to a whaler just before she were launched. So, so, uh, just for a little bit of background, I'm, I'm curious about this, like, um, how long would it take to build a ship like that? Uh, in, in a real ship? Yeah. Not as long as you think. They would build them in six to seven months. Um, they, these guys were skilled. They knew exactly what they were doing, and many of the ships were very similar, so it didn't, right. didn't okay. take them that long to do them. They built basically three different types with the predominant types. They built coastal schooners, which this is a model of, and that's a picture of it over on the wall over there. She was the last ship launched on the North River. All of the tools and all of the items in here came about as a result the families who owned all the shipyards on the wall over there. They're all been given as gifts to the museum in the hopefulness that they would be displayed. And as you can see, we've tried. Um, some of them have recently been broken. This is a belt for this treadle lathe. And now this treadle lathe works exactly like your grandmother's treadle lathe used to. You pump it with your feet, it spins, and some of the chips down there are real chips because I cut them. They do have to repair the belt. That's coming up next week, I think. <laughs> the mural on the wall was done by a gentleman named Skip Toomey, who is an art teacher here in Situate. And uh, again, we have examples of different types of caulking. 
<coughs> and just so that everybody know, both of these types of clockings are used on major ocean going ships made of wood. And the white is nothing more than raw cotton. And what they did was they would soak that in linseed oil and drive that in between the planks of the ship using caulking tools similar to this. These are caulking tools. And there's another set of displays. Those are curled caulking tools. So we have all kinds of adzes and things like that. After the cotton is set, they then take hemp. And hemp is soaked in tar. And that's what you see is the black caulking. And they drive that right on top of the cotton. And between the two of them, they will keep a ship watertight for years, literally, without any problems, whether they're in the warm or the cold waters. So it's just a, it's a remarkable device for doing a very simple job, a very critical job. You know, I just think that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Well, you know what I mean? Like the, it's like, how do you insulate a ship? Well, that's it. There um, you go. It's pretty simple, but pretty, pretty critical. Um, I'll give you a little story about uh, Sam Adams. Everyone knows about Sam Adams. He was supposed to be this big beer maker. <laughs> he wasn't. He was a failure as a beer maker. Um, when he failed at that, he ended up buying into one of my family's items, which was the Bent Cracker Factory in Milton. Now, we had one of the first government contracts with the U.S. Navy to supply hardtack. Now, hardtack had a number of uses. You could eat it. But its best use was, was stuffing it in the cannons and shooting at the bad guys with it. The stuff was so hard that it had the capability, at least they said, of sinking an enemy ship. So it's pretty interesting stuff. But at any rate, the family finally got him out of the business. And he went into Boston and he learned the cocker's trade in the East Boston shipyards. And that's one of the things he should be known for. And it's a story that goes along with that. That any time they were having a problem caulking a ship, he would walk the whole caulker's crew off the site. They would have a big discussion, come back later and tell the owners or the supervisors what had to be done to fix the ship because they weren't going to build a ship that wouldn't float. And when they went off the site, is what he should be known for. Congress does the same thing today. And it's spelled differently, but it's the same thing. They hold a caucus. That's Spell differently is C A U K, you know, C as it is today, as opposed to C A L K E R S, which was the cockers in his day. But that's what he should be known for, and he's never known for it. Some of the other things we have are uh, these are all hand forged drill bits that are used for drilling holes in the hulls of ships on the decks down onto the frames. And we keep these out of here for the kids. They're all they've all been dulled intentionally so the kids don't hurt themselves. But they do love to turn them. They just get the biggest kick out of them. Turning these things around and listening to the noise. That's their favorite thing. But on these pieces, you can see where the cold forging was done on somebody's blacksmith forge. So they're beautiful pieces. They're very, very rare to find them still whole. You find a lot of them that are broken on if you don't know what they are. That's, that's it. Um, this is a rigging vice. This piece over here, I don't know if you can see it. And this vice is used for making the rigging that's shown in black on the ship model. And that's called standing rigging. It's the rigging that supports the mast, not the sails. Anything that's other than that is called running rigging. It's used to run the sails up and down, reposition them. And we have a company set up. And they're doing this right now in the Constitution in Boston. I'm a member of the Constitution ship built. Really? Yeah. So, and this trunk is another one. Like yeah, that. maybe it's around. This is an absolutely <laughs> beautiful piece. It was made by a gentleman named Thomas Barstow, TB, who lived in Norwell, which at the time was South Sydney. <coughs> and he was a ship's carpenter, but he did not go to sea. He was strictly he was strictly a landman, and uh, he would hear a contract being done in one of the shipyards and he would throw this on the back of his dray with his horse attached right up to the yard and say, are you going to have a captain's cabin on this boat? You don't want it to look like a junk cabin. You need something that looks like this. And who could say no to that? You know, it's just amazing. The hearts, oh my god. Yeah, all the different, and they're all different pieces of wood. Adorable. Now I'll tell you a story. When this crack occurred, see the crack that goes across the front? Yeah. These five diamonds, for whatever reason, fell out. 
and somebody with all good intentions glued them back in. And it's a perfect example of why you never use glue on an antique. You can see the staining that occurs from the glue. Oh no. But Thomas Barso was quite a character. He became quite a famous man. He became a representative to the state of Massachusetts and traveled by train into Boston for his weekly meetings. And we have here his train tickets from 1899. <laughs> you get that? That is pretty remarkable. This one's starting to come apart now. I gotta do some repair work. A little restoration would help. But it's really remarkable to have something that's that old. It's just a plain old train ticket. Oh, this expired in 1892. This is way <laughs> expired. <laughs> Isn't that crazy though? Cool. He also had an instruction book which includes all the rules and regulations for members of the court of Massachusetts. And this was his. Uh, now what's interesting is we got a hold of a, a current one not too long ago and there is absolutely no difference at all. It's word for word exactly the same as it was in the 1800s. Now uh, this is a print of the, the ship Columbia which the Columbia River is named after. Now, she sailed around the world with this little sloop which was the Lady Washington. Now the Columbia River should actually be named the Lady Washington. I'll tell you the story of why. On the way up the river, the Columbia River is very, very big. It's very wide, but it's also very shallow. has tons of shoals and sandbars. She ran hard aground on a bar and couldn't get off. So they un unloaded her onto the Lady Washington and then sailed upriver and traded goods with the Indians for furs beads and things like that, like you hear about in the stories. She came back so heavily loaded herself that she ran around on a sandbar too. Exact same bar from the other direction. 